Good evening, everyone. Oh. Sorry about that. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, during the meeting, all participants will be in control of their own microphone. Please ensure that you turn off your microphone when you are speaking and remember to turn it off when you are finished. Um, all reports published as part of the agenda will be considered as read by members of the panel published reports will therefore be summarised to allow the panel to focus on questions. And can I also say, by entering the room, um, you give permission for your, your, um, this filming to be, to be used. If you have a problem with that, you need to go to committee services manager. Um, apologies for absence. I've received apologies from Matt Hartley, uh, Ibis Williams and Cathy Douse. Are there any other apologies for leaving early or anything? No? Thank you. There was no urgent business. Um, members, we asked if they have any declarations of interest. Do you have any declarations of interest? No. And we move on to the first item, the statutory scrutiny of Safer Greenwich Partnership, women, Women's Safety. That's being presented by Sharon Whittington. When you're ready, Sharon. Thanks. Yes, Ollie. Yes, sorry, before we start the proceeding, I have uh, nominated myself as a spo uh, spokesperson for the panel and those that are not here to thank you as this is likely to be your last as a chair. So thank you for your hard work and uh, I've been with the panel for two years now and I've really enjoyed it. So thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Very much. It's very kind of you. I've enjoyed it as well. So thanks. Sharon, over to you. Thanks. OK. Um, yes, good evening, uh, councillors. Um, I'm Sharon Whittington. I'm the head of Safer Communities and Partnership. And I'm going to present the report. Um, and I have with me Annette Hines, who is a manager within my team, who leads the work that we do strategically, um, is her main role as lead on violence against women and girls. And uh, she will assist me in dealing with any of your questions because she's that bit closer to the detail of it than me. Oh, and also apologies, I've got a cold, so I can't project quite like I wish. So lucky we've got this. Um, so, as you may know, uh, violence against women and girls has been a strategic priority for the Safer Greenwich Partnership for many years now, and it continues to be. Um, and having said violence against women and girls once, I hope it's okay if from now on I go for its rather clunky but much shorter acronym of VORG, because otherwise there's going to be a lot of long phrase getting in the way of the flow. Um, so it's... VORG is an issue that's much wider than Greenwich, um, and at both the national and London-wide level, VORG policy focuses on eight to ten core issues. It varies slightly depending on which agency is looking at it and how many of them are directly relevant to them. But um, some of the key ones within that are domestic abuse, sexual offending, so-called honour-based violence, female genital mutilation, stalking, forced marriage, and sexual exploitation. And the council's work for all of the time that it has been a, an SGP priority has been focused on that agenda structured pretty much in the same way. But then events in 2021 galvanized a public focus on an additional and in some ways broader aspect of VORG that of women's and girls' general safety, and especially public safety, safety in public spaces, whether that's indoor or outdoor. And of course, you'll recognize that this arose particularly from the murders of Sarah Everard and in our own borough, Sabina Nessa. So the council responded to this with a wide-reaching public consultation exercise that led to the publication in autumn 2022 of a cross-council women's and girls' safety plan. 
And although their plan is a council initiative, the work that's needed to progress it and all of the areas under the SGP's VORG priority involves input from many of the SGP's member agencies. The action plan is divided into four main areas of focus, as shown um, on page 13 at paragraph 4.3. And you can see there um, prevention of response to domestic abuse, safety of women and girls in public places um, as a theme in itself, education of young people, particularly boys, but also men within educational settings. That came up very strongly from the public consultation. There was a desire to see men and boys being supported to be part of the solution rather than always identified as the problem. Um, and then improving equalities and accessibility for women and girls in terms of how the council operates and how key services are delivered. And then the safety plan was drawn up using five key themes or principles, which you can see at 4.4 over the page. Um, the five E's, if you like, of enforcement, education, engagement and empowerment, engineering, and equalities and equity. And some of those are more relevant to some of those for initial themes that we just looked at than others, but they were all considered. And then from there on, the report uh, gives a more detailed consideration of the work done under each of those initial areas. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. An excellent report, as always. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes. Yeah, thanks for the report. Um, how exactly do you approach it educationally wise? Is that from secondary schools onwards or do you do early reaching primary schools? Bring in Annette in a second, but um, there is a particular emphasis on secondary schools, but we recognize it needs to start earlier than that. Would you like to say a bit about the work done? Uh, yeah, we, we cover both primary and secondary. In primary schools, we've got an organisation called Belly, who have been doing transitional work for young people um, who transition into secondary school to get them prepared and understanding sort of the nature of healthy relationships between boys and girls, etc. but age-appropriate work. And in secondary schools, we... Um, done a number of things uh, we commission a theatre workshop little fish who actually do a lot of develop have developed a number of plays are, that are addressing um, relationships and uh, misogyny etc and their, their latest one has also included um, the impact of social media as well in that um, but alongside that, we also commissioned them to deliver a project called Embrace, which um, does workshops with young men and um, boys who have been identified by the schools themselves as showing worrying attitudes towards women and girls. And the workshops have really highlighted how they've done this. Um, it's a, it's a group-led workshop that really explores their nature of why they feel, think the way they do about women and girls and actually how they can think of other ways. It encourages the young people to kind of challenge each other as well. And um, it's worked very well, actually. They really have improved in their sort of understanding of their behaviour towards women and girls. So, and they've also, far beyond the estimated reach, they've reached more than that, which is in the report. So... Yes, we've done quite a lot. And MOPAC have also funded, which is coming soon, in two of our schools, um, believe to do a secondary school um, project as well. So there's a number of things running across, and we're very much in support in doing, bringing things into schools. We're aware of schools, they're, they're more likely to take things up if, if they're funded and they don't have the cost involved, but we do it that way. Yeah, thanks. And, and is that well received, that 
opportunity for the children. Very, very well received, yes. Um, um, and we like to actually, uh, we're really doing a focus on not just um, focus on girls, but the focus on the boys. I think it's so important that you do both because we need that understanding in our young people. I think um, we have the sense that schools are more focused and open to the need to work on these issues of their own volition than they were a few years ago when there was a lot of denial and it was hard to open the doors to get projects into them. I think now it's switched to a situation where for the most part they're grateful for any resources that can support them to tackle this in their schools, whether it's preventative or as I say targeted work addressing those who are already showing concerning behaviour. And that's a positive change. Thank you. One of the questions I was going to ask, so, um, Leo. Cool. Well, thank you for the report and for all your hard work and your team's hard work. Um, and I can see there's a lot of concrete steps being taken and lots of statistics in the report. Do you think these steps are making women and girls feel safer in, in the Royal Borough of Greenwich? That's such a good question, isn't it? And I don't, mean, I don't say that by means of like trying to dodge it, but you'd almost have to ask individual women and girls to really know that, wouldn't you? Um, I think some of our really sort of focused, localised work, I would like to say, if it was me, it would make me feel better. Um, for example, we promote an initiative that the police has. It's London-wide, but it's very, very local in its application, and that's their Walk and Talk initiative. And through that, they make um, women police officers available um, and these are ones who are like just two or three in, in a borough that have a, a particular focus on this area of work. So like they've built up expertise and experience in delivering this project. So it's not just like any random woman officer. Um, but they will meet with individual women or women's groups. Um, and it's the opportunity to discuss, usually while walking around a local area of concern, to discuss in detail aspects of a location where women don't feel safe and, and why that is, and then look for what can be done to improve that. And often that's not a policing response. It might be, but it often isn't. It's often something about the management, maintenance, design of the location, and then they can pass on that information to us or directly to other services that they know are best placed to kind of respond to that. So I think it's fair to assume that that's likely to be improving confidence among women, but that really depends on so many different factors, doesn't it? Um, and we can only try and influence some. And of course, there has been a lot of negative publicity for the Met Police, unfortunately, that tends to push in the opposite direction. So we are aware that this is a really complex area of work. And that's why I welcome something as direct and personable as the police doing that, because it puts a very human face of concern and responsiveness on the police for the community to kind of perhaps build some faith through. But there are so many factors that make women and girls not feel safe when they're out, and we can try and improve it, but we can't deal with all of them on our own. Um, I guess it's just good to be part of improving it, not necessarily solving it. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for all the work you are doing. It's always very valuable. Um, I had a few questions, but I suppose firstly, the, the Women's Safety Plan that you was brought in in 2022, I presume a lot of the work that's in that was already happening beforehand anyway, and it's been kind of brought up into a more official plan. But how do you kind of... How, how do you feel it's been effective, to, or hasn't been effective, to have it in more of a, an official plan? Or what's, what do you see as the difference between sort of pre-2022 and post-2022 in how you are able to kind of deliver that, that sort of safety, so the increased safety. If I can press the button. All right. Um, yes, um, I think what the Women's Safety Plan did, and I think that which is really important, is it actually, whereas we were just focusing on VOLG, what we didn't do as part of VOLG in the early days, um, 
pre, pre the plan was really focus on women's public safety, the safety of women in public spaces. And also, it's enabled us to really focus on the issue of misogyny and tackling sort of lewd behaviour, um, harassment, etc. And that wider uh, situation that women and girls find themselves in in the local community, on the buses, for example, and the trains, uh, even just walking down the street and where they feel safer. So with the development of the Women's Safety Plan, it has really brought that area of work into positive action, positive um, movement forward, etc., to complement, so not take away from anything we're doing around violence against women and girls, which is dominated by domestic abuse, to be honest, because that is the most prominent uh, problem we're dealing with in, in, in women's sort of who are at risk. But it's taking it out into that public spaces and looking at um, what we're doing. And I think that's where the positivity has really come. Um, it's enabled, we've now got officers, for example, that walk about the streets that are vogue led so focusing on the safety of women. We've got um, officers that are also ambassadors to, against sort of violence against women and girls. And it really has put that focus there firmly on public safety as well to support all the other work we're doing around Borg and the main strands. And, and if, I can, if I can follow on, um, yes to all that. Um, I think the plan and the way it was developed is really valuable because it was led very much by um, senior members of the council, which gave it a profile and a priority, which has been useful in engaging and galvanising some other parts of the council who perhaps traditionally didn't see this as something that was very relevant to what they're responsible for doing. So that's opened some doors from us, for us and we've been able to build on it. Um, and I think it's, it's been really valuable to give it that kind of momentum which perhaps it wouldn't have had otherwise if it was down to just officers to try and reach out to departments who have other agendas and are very busy. Um, and following that theme, um, Annette's little team have organised two events that we've rather grandly called VORG symposiums within the last 12 months, which have been mainly for... Um, managers and staff of other council services. It has included some external partners, but the underlying theme of those events have been VORG is everyone's business, especially from the preventative and the identifying it happening point of view. Um, so we've been talking to services that go into homes or into businesses for reasons that have nothing to do with community safety, they may be welfare focused or housing focused, but who have the opportunity to observe things that are indicators of domestic abuse or indeed other kinds of borg perhaps happening in a household. Um, and we've encouraged them to have the confidence to trust their in intuition that there may be something here that people more specialised in this area of work need to be made aware of and, and can follow up on. Um, so I think, again, having the Women's Public Safety Plan and the political leadership of that gave that a platform on which we could kind of create these events and get people who otherwise might just think, oh, I've been invited to this by accident, it's nothing to do with me, to actually be there in the room. Thank you. Anne-Marie? Oops. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to come in on Councillor Littlewood's question, and uh, I thought it was a very good question because, if I'm understanding correctly, how do we know things are working? Yeah, they yeah. So I wanted to come in on that and 
just in case anyone who is viewing wondering who is this person that's sudden jumping, it's Anne-Marie Cousins, no nameplate, and I'm the cabinet member for community safety and enforcement. So yes, I endorse everything that the officers said, but I just wanted to give a couple of examples that might help. So for example, this Tuesday, I was on Power Street for a, a different event, and uh, I was speaking to an elder and asking about how she felt about being safe going about um, the area. And she made it clear to me that, one, number one, she looks confident wherever she's going. And number two, it was so nice to see she had that rattly, you know, these noisy things that you're giving, not the alarm, but it's like a bell. And she goes, I rattle wherever I go. So, so I thought that was good. There's, there's so many things that the officers are doing. It's, this is just a, a tinsel wincy um, bit of it. But also, as well, another thing that I was speaking to somebody about, and they thought it was odd that our, if we're so, all the programs we're doing, so why are the numbers in terms of complaints to the police going up? And I said, well, that's actually a success factor because it shows the zero tolerance that we're putting towards this sort of behavior, whether it's misogyny, you know, catcalling, whatever is happening to women and girls in public places or in their, their private homes, they're reporting it. And then what is great is that the police has also shifted because they're taking these things more seriously. So the more it's organic, the more that people become aware of that reporting makes a difference, the more they will report. So it's actually a success factor that our reporting figures have, have gone up. People are confident to report. So I think that's something to, to use as an actual success factor when not, people are not feeling what's the point, so they're not going to report. So I just wanted to add that um, on top of what um, officers are doing and have said, yeah. Hope that helps. Thank you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. I've got one of those bells on my back. <laughs> um, I was going to ask a question about the, the training and the going into the schools and the workshops. Um, I know the schools may be happy about it, but how do the students actually receive it? Are they, are they quite vocal? Are they, do they take part? And that would also be for primary and, and secondary. Just wanted to ask that, really. Um, just very much so. Very, they are very much involved in the... Um, from the feedback I get from the Little Fish Fear Company, for example, is that actually the young people are very vocal. They, they watch the performance and then they do a workshop afterwards where actually the young people have an opportunity to actually talk to the characters within the play, which addresses... And some of the questions that come out of um, those uh, workshop sessions are really enlightening to us. Um, for example, they challenge the behavior of um, uh, the characters within the play. So they will actually say, well, why did you do that? Didn't you realize it was going to do that? So they get very much involved in how the play is uh, presented to them and what they can ask. Um, also, um, they, they do full evaluation as well. And what they do, they do evaluation before and afterwards. And it really highlights, they, they get a greater understanding of what it means to be misogynistic and what it means to have a bad relationship. What the reason, they get a greater understanding of what, the impact of posting things, for example, on social media that may send out negative messages, etc. So it's all about that. But one thing I do say is the children, and I've been to a number of schools over the years, I've been here quite a while, witnessed and actually visited the schools while they're putting on the production. The young people love them. They really do. It's, this is probably why I've commissioned them um, quite regularly over the years, is the fact that I've seen it in action. They sit there and they are totally silent. They watch the performance and they're so engaged in it. Whereas actually, if you sit there and just give them a lesson, it's not the same impact. And, and I would add that I think we're fortunate to have found um, this locally based provider for these theatre workshops because I've observed and been impressed by how much 
real understanding and depth of research and thought on the part of the theatre company has gone into the issue. They don't just produce approach it from the point of view of doing a theatre piece and having a chat afterwards. Their level of understanding about this is actually quite sophisticated and impressive. So they, they're able to handle very skillfully a lot of difficult things that might come out of from those workshops, which I wouldn't necessarily have assumed that a theatre company, even with a lot of experience in this area of work, would be able to do. So I think we're fortunate with that. Yeah, another, another thing, just, just another thing they do as well, as far as their research comes, uh, when they're developing a new play, they actually invite us along as, as experts to go along and see the development of the play to actually input into what, whether they think we need to change things, whether or not they can put more in to actually really make it relevant to what we know about um, our, areas, our areas of expertise. Thank you, Annette, and thank you, Sharon. Um, another question I've got is, um, in, um, oh, mine's gone blank. <laughs> I'm thinking all these things. I, I'll, I'll get Olu to come in first, and then I'll have another thing. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation, which is uh, very impressive, especially your plan in education of young people and you know training them but you mentioned the word worrying behavior so what are the characteristics or how do you spot a, a, a boy uh, has got a worrying behavior towards uh, girls thanks i don't know if annette has a fuller answer to this we'll find out in a moment but <laughs> I would just stress that it isn't us who do the identifying. It's the schools who you know, know the young people and are working with them directly. So you know, we take their steer and judgment on that. Do you have any insight into that? No, that's exactly it. The referrals for the Embrace project come directly from the schools. It's the schools who obviously know the young people well. Um, they know what's going on in the young person's life and they're the ones that make the referrals. Um, we wouldn't know the young people well enough to actually identify those worrying behaviours, but basically it's showing negative attitudes towards women and girls. Um, sometimes it can be actual actions that lead them to be the referred, and sometimes it's actually what they're saying. Thank you. My, my question was about, um, I read about Bexley putting in shop, getting shops to actually say this is a safe space. Do we do anything like that or we've, have we considered doing anything like that in, um, in Greenwich? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we, we have. We have um, predominantly led by uh, my counterpart um, who deals with serious violence. Um, we have developed in the borough safe havens and these safe havens have also incorporated uh, the violence against women and girls uh, basically venues um, such as uh, it's the, the McDonald's in Eltham is one I think. Mm, I think um, there's two or three in our local McDonald's franchise that are in locations relevant to you know, relative hotspots. Yeah mm -hmm. and, and basically they're places where young people both boys and girls can actually go when they feel unsafe and ask for help. And adults. And, uh, yeah, and adults. Uh, they also contain, and we, um, I know she put a lot of work into it, um, like bleed kits and defibrillators, can't say it, but, um, and uh, uh, first aid equipment so that if anything happens that they're able to respond and they've had the training as well in these uh, venues. I can get a list of venues, but I'd need to go to my colleague. She's got it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. Do we have any other? Oh, Maisie. Thanks. Just uh, some other, other one. Um, so one of the five E's is about, you said about engineering and like making public spaces safer. Um, so I think at the moment, the, the new local plan is being developed within regeneration about um, new planning rules for the borough. 
is, is your team and the local plan team working together to like make sure that the new local plan will have like be considering women's public safety you would actually get a much better answer or to be honest an answer at all um if my equivalent um the head of safer spaces were here because it's her team that would be doing that because um safer spaces is the team that has the on the ground, out and about in the public um, staff. So the uniformed community safety enforcement officers, among others. So they have a focus on the practicalities of locations and how any kinds of community safety issues are playing out in, in public areas. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't actually tell you. We'd have to take that away and come back to you. Alice. <laughs> Yes, if I, if I just said that, I don't know if I'm being a little bit too harsh, but let me say in theory, that's what's meant to happen. In practice, it depends on certain things. So if something is in development, there is opportunities for meetings, but I would say perhaps the role of the safety side perhaps needs a little bit more taken a bit more seriously perhaps, but it, it is there, the processes are there, but it's they don't have the final say, but they do have that ability to give their concerns or expertise to what they think, you know, like for example, the works down at Woolwich there and, you know, all these things happening, they can raise issues, but the, the ultimate decision rests with Regen. So I suppose, what is it, input? Opportunity for input, not necessarily the decisive decision, if that helps, so it's there. It, it came up already, actually, and I did raise something about it, so that's why I'm able to respond. <laughs> that's all right. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much. For any, any other questions? No? No, thank you very much for your reports and your support. <laughs> Excellent, as always. Thank you. We now have a community protection. Oh, sorry, no. First of all, we were just asked to note this uh, report, but it does say in six, in six one and six two on page twenty seven, it says available options in six one and six two. So six two says continue to support services to address fog. This will ensure that RBG continue to provide support to victims and undertake preventative work to reduce offending and encourage behavioural change. So, yes, agreed that. Thank you. So, we now have Community Protection Team Programme. Ella Smallcom. Sorry, I don't know the gentleman's name. Good evening, Chair and Councillors. This is Stephen Lewis. He's, John. He's an operations manager for the community and environmental protection team. So, hello, Ella Smalkham. I'm just going to introduce the report and then I will hand over to, to Stephen. We'll be able to take you through some of the headlines. We weren't going to take you through page by page because we've got the, the report in front of you. So, Yeah, so, so we'll, we'll just go through some headlines for you. But this is a, a performance and update report for the community protection team and this really follows on from a reorganization that took what was a noise team and an ASB team working very much in silo and in different services um, prior to 2019 I think it was 2019 um, and then the, the production of this community protection team that brought those services together and expanded some of the remit as well so this covers statutory nuisance across the borough um, across all tenures, um, private properties, um, business properties as well, but we also have commission services, so we, we, a lot of our work is for our tenancy teams um, and our tenanted properties in the borough. Um, so on that note, I'll hand over to Stephen, who will take you through some of the headlines. Thank you. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Good evening. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, sort of Ella touched on the, uh, the, the reason for the reorganisation. Um, a lot of the statutory nuisance that we deal with is noise based and noise ties in with antisocial behaviour, uh, certainly on a residential level quite closely. So um, the, the, the team um, 
the, the sort of the overview of what we what we implemented was to change the working hours from the previous from the previous setup into having a more comprehensive weekend service, allowing officers to be available for more um, reactive call out during the daytime into later into the evening. Uh, but also um, we um, changed the proactive approach. We have got far more proactive approach now to um, problem premises across the borough. Um, and with that, we, we, we link in very closely to other teams such as licensing um, and, and assist with um, their out of hours work as well. So um, I think I was just going to focus on the, the, the first page of the report, which is the key areas and just as it kind of is the perfect overview of what we do um, and how we're doing it. So as well as those hours, we've updated a lot of our um, equipment and our, and our evidence gathering tools. Um, we implemented the noise app. There's a, there's a whole slide on the noise app within the within the uh, the uh, PowerPoint. But the <coughs> the noise app was originally a crucial tool during COVID, during lockdown. We were using the noise app to gather evidence where we were simply unable to enter houses. Um, and and through that, we did have some successful enforcement um, f against those that were causing noise nuisance um, and 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 those that thought they would be able to get away with it. Really. Um, <coughs> As well as that, we, we introduced body-worn video for, uh, for uh, evidence gathering purposes, obviously, but also for officer safety. We, we were asking officers to do a lot more early intervention, knocking at doors, which didn't really happen in the previous, in the previous arrangements. So, you know, we get called to a property, speak to the people, early intervention gets you a quicker result, can get the peace that people deserve in their home, rather than walking away. To do that, the body wall video picks up the evidence of what they're experiencing, but also um, it, it provides the officers with safety, provides the residents with safety, as, and, and allows us to answer any queries about the incident itself. Um, as I said earlier, we work closely with licensing. We, we provide responses to license applications for premises. Um, this includes variations to licenses and temporary event notices. Um, we are the council's statu statutory consultee um, for, for those applications um, from, a, from a noise point of view. Um, we manage the ASB case review process. So for those that may not be familiar, the, the ASB case review used to be called the community trigger. It allows residents to um, uh, question how their, how, the, how their case has been handled. There's, there's criteria that is stated under the legislation that we follow, but we are the lead. And it doesn't need to necessarily be ASB or a case that comes through our team. It can be any issue across the council. So it could be a, could be a parking issue, which doesn't necessarily fall within our remit, but the resident's not happy with how it's been handled, so they can use the review process, and we will contact the relevant services and lead on that response um, and, and that process. That's all on, on the council website. Um, it's well advertised, and we publish our our outcomes as well yearly. Um, <clears throat> the, um, we've had a, a uh, mediation, a third party mediation contract in place for some of our cases where enforcement's just not needed. But we just need to get neighbors to talk to each other, so, uh, but they don't necessarily feel that they can. And the, part of the company that we contracted to help with that are experts. They will contact the parties with their, with their approval um, and, and that's resolved a number of cases for us. Um, I mentioned the noise app. Um, we've had just over 20,000 noise recordings made since we started using the app. Um, just to, to give you an idea of how powerful that's been. Um, and, and we've served a number of notices on the result of, of those recordings and some cases have gone further. Um, service requests as a, as, a, as a team since the 1st of August 2020, we've dealt with approximately 13,000 service requests. Um, a majority of those will be noise and loud music related, um, but that's, that's a substantial number of, of requests. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, we, use, um, we use legislation to enforce against those that are causing problems, uh, but uh, the number of notices that we've served since the, uh, since the formation of the team um, has considerably increased. Um, this is, again, in large part down to the reworking of the hours and being more available later into the evening and, and the weekends when 
residents really need us. Um, there's some case studies in the PowerPoint. I didn't know if you'd really want me to go through specifics on those at the moment, but um, I think um, the, the other thing that's worth referencing is our work with our tenancy services. Um, so I, it's not in the report. I didn't get a chance to put it in, but we've just run some data, some numbers this week. Um, approximately 52% 52, 52 of the cases that we're dealing with um, relate to those that live in RBG properties. And that's, that's all, um, it's included um, leaseholders. So that's, that's quite, a, that's quite a, a large number of council tenants that we are helping to, to deal with their issues. Um, yeah, and then just, just some of the highlights. Um, we've used our tools really successfully um, to, to close, uh, close a property that was being used um, for, for drug abuse. Um, we've used our powers to prosecute um, commercial premises for breaching the noise abatement notice. Um, we've, um, we've used our powers to modify the behavior um, of, a, of, a, of a resident that's, um, that's caused significant harassment towards some of her neighboring properties. Um, and and we, yeah, we've had some good, good results in court with prosecutions, so we're, we're doing some really good enforcement work. Thank you, Ella and Stephen. Very good, very good report. And I must say the noise app is excellent because it then also reports it, doesn't it? It goes straight through. Uh, questions? Olu? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. I love the uh, uh, case studies there. It is very, very impressive, and there are some success stories there as well. So I love that, and I love how you compare us with our neighbours. I like to compare myself and say, look, I'm doing better than you. So I love that as well. However, you said... Um, during your, your uh, investigation or carrying out uh, all this, you, our staff goes with body camera, which is very good. However, do you have any legislation by law to inform them that I'm recording you? And if that is the case, how do we manage that for our staff safety? And I'm talking uh, from a retail point of view, where I work, we use body camera. However, we have to inform that person that we are recording you due to your suspicious behavior. And it has happened that they just smash you or um, smash the camera. So how do we mitigate that with the safety of our colleagues, of our staff, if I can put it that way? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so the, um, usually when we attend a report, a, re a reactive response to a report, um, we're visiting the, the person that's contacted the service first. They're looking for our help. So because they're looking for our help, when we arrive, we introduce ourselves and we explain why we're wearing the, why we're there wearing the body-worn camera. Um, and, and to be fair, I don't think we've encountered any issues with, with that because, like I said, we're there to help the resident and, and therefore they understand why we're using it. Um, in terms of coming away from the reportee to go into where the problem is, um, we've often gathered the evidence already from within the home of the person that's reported. Um, and the officers are all trained in dynamic risk assessment. So when they're, when they're there, they'll, as I said earlier, the early intervention, they'll, they'll knock at the door and they'll try and speak to someone. Again, they will always introduce and explain that they're wearing a body-worn camera, but as part of their dynamic risk assessment, they're always aware of their surroundings and they're always ready, ready to retreat. Um, and, and to be fair, officer, officer safety comes first. So, you know, if, if we've already established the evidence as well, we've, it's all on the camera, we, we just remove ourselves from the situation. Leo. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks for the report. So, when you're visiting RBG properties, say for noise, which 90% of it is noise, do you then hand that over to tenancy services to deal with the residents? Or... Can you now, now you've got a little bit more power, can you now go in and say, confiscate the stereo equipment? I might have a follow-up question, and all if that's all right. Thanks. 
So, um, we work together. Um, I, I, I think um, we, have, we have different powers. So our officers have powers under the uh, Environmental Protection Act and we can follow those to take action for the, for the noise. Um, yes, we can seize equipment. There's a process we have to follow. We're going to have to gather evidence or sufficient evidence before we can simply seize the equipment. But yes, we can obtain a, a warrant of entry and go in and take away the equipment. Um, the, our <coughs> we will prosecute for that um, and for, for the breach of the, for an abatement notice. But we'll provide statements to the tenancy officer for that address as well to support any action that they choose to take um, under the tenancy agreement. So it's very much partnership working. So thanks for that then. So what I'm trying to get to is, so as a local councillor, the complaints I get is, so obviously loud music, people, people I don't know what the mystery is with moving furniture at two o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. or residents that smoke marijuana on the balcony or out in the back gardens and other residents got their windows open. So they always say to me, is we've reported it, we've reported the noise and the antisocial behaviour to your team, but nothing happens, and tenancy are not doing anything about it. So I know it's probably a housing issue, but I'm just trying to try and explain it. I'm just trying to find a way where uh, we can, as councillors, we can link that to say, actually, well, if we speak to you, you'll you've got, especially with body cameras, now you have that evidence. So there's no reason why tenancy shouldn't be enforcing the tenancy agreement, if that makes sense, if you've done your part. Pick up a couple of things. So if, so, so if, someone, yeah. sorry, so if someone was antisocial, would you then go back in six months once you've handed it a tenancy and say a tenancy, right, flat A, wherever, what action did you take against the antisocial resident? Or you just leave it to tenancy? I'm not so, trying to get you to moan about housing, but I'm trying to get you to moan. But no, but you know what I mean. There is yeah. oh, that's, as a local councillor, that's that's what I get all the time off residents. Yeah. yeah, and it's I think it's a widespread issue. So it's something that was recently we we did cover a little bit on it. In um, we'll touch on it. I haven't got the page numbers, I've got it on our slides. We've got one about commission services for the investigation of noise and ASB. And this is a piece of work that was done recently um, as part of the Regulation Ready programme and also a report completed by the Ombudsman about how local authorities deal with, in particular, noise complaints. Um, and something that was highlighted was that interaction between services and that it's not always as seamless as it could be and how we deal with that. Um, so we've been working alongside our colleagues in tenancy services to produce a service level agreement so that we improve on that, how we, we join up and how we hand over cases. Because it's, it's really that point at which, you know, we've, we're a commission service, so we will gather evidence um, to support further action being taken by our tenancy colleagues if they wish to pursue something like a, a notice of possession, which something like a noise abatement notice would give them grounds to do so. Um, but it would at that point be for them for them to decide whether it, that was an appropriate course of action. From our perspective, we'll, we'll gather the evidence of the noise or the ASB occurring at the time and then thinking about where that handover is and in particular how it is presented to our residents as well because that's what you're, you're receiving reports of. Obviously, they don't feel it is seamless at the moment. So we obviously need to look at how that, that comes across to people and, and that handover process a bit more. Yeah. Stephen might have, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, was that uh, only, it? That does, but I mean, only from a more operational point of view is that we have weekly tasking meetings, mm -hmm. which is through our integrated enforcement setup, and both my officers and tenancy officers attend. So if there is a particular address, it can be discussed at that meeting. Um, and we also have a problem premises panel. So for severe, um, severe problems, they go to that panel. And those cases can be discussed again in multi-agency. Police are also in attendance, so they, they, you know, they, I think Ella's probably right on the, on on sort of some some addresses there isn't that seamless, but also on sort of the most problematic addresses there is very much a, a joined up approach. Yeah, just one one more one more for me. Sorry. So do you do you like have a system say an alarm bell where 
you're constantly going to 1A six, seven times a year, maybe more, and then the following year you're still going back to 1A. Um, we, we can put... We, yes, not an alarm bell such, but we have flags that we can set up on our database. Um, but again, uh, the officers are designated to patches across the borough. They know their patches, certainly in my team anyway. And tenants have a similar approach. They're, they're patch-based. Um, so because the problem addresses, thankfully, obviously there are some, but they're not, they're few, they're, they're few. There's, there's less problem addresses than there are um, well-maintained well premises. So because of that, we know where they are and we know what to expect when we get called there. Just to add on to that, just very briefly, we're also putting together um, like a customer charter that we want to work on. So it's about getting a bit of feedback from our residents about what their expectations of the service, service is. So the bits that they want from us, um, which I think is coming through in your questions in particular. Um, so, you know, what happens when there are these repeat offenders? Um, our officers are very familiar with their cases, but also our, we have a, a comprehensive database that records these incidents. Um, but yeah, that's, those are all sorts of things that our residents will want to know, and we need to think about that in how we're delivering the service. So we'll be taking that, that forward. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Anne-Marie. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to add um, to what officers are saying, and you, you sort of covered it towards the end there, the expectations, I think we do need to be very clear with that. It's a small team um, that, that's dealing with the work. But when it comes to things like noise as well, if it's, um, I don't know what the shift is at the moment for the hours, but it's not a 24-hour service, which is part of the problem. To be able to say, take things to where a fine or, or court cases and build up that evidence, the officers do have to witness it. And then what you generally get, and I, I really do feel for residents about this, a lot of these noise perhaps are happening in the evenings, weekends, overnight, not being witnessed, just not progressing. And in the meantime, the resident is like tearing whatever hair they've got left out of their head sort of thing. So we do understand it's difficult. That's why I tend to push the noise out because at least that's an independent and as reliable as possible way of recording the noise that will help officers to build up the history. I think even despite that, you still have to witness it though, don't you? And that's part of the delay. So the process can be so long and so demoralizing for the affected resident, but somehow for your wards, please just encourage them. I, I have to do the same for my ward. Please just keep reporting it, keep logging it. You could keep a diary. If you don't want to be reporting everybody, keep a diary. When you've, your diary is a week old or something, get it off to your counselor or, or to the noise team so that that history is being built up eventually things happen and eventually somebody might get out there and witness the noise and then eventually it gets done. But yes, we won't have a um, work with housing, but it's going to be up to housing in terms of tenancy services, because I know I have raised that myself, saying, well, there is a tenancy agreement. Are they breaching their tenancy? That is up to, to housing to eventually, <laughs> once there is sufficient, it's not a one-off incident. It's not so intermittent that it's a year apart. It has to be consistent and really a nuisance. And that's part of the difficulty with this, with this sort of thing. Yeah. So if, there, if it's a really ongoing issue, just ask the resident to persevere. And because it's working together, it, it's like they're the ones that live there. They know what's going on. And it, we're not meaning to be slow and so on. It's just that you can't go to court or anywhere with half-hashed evidence. It has to be strong evidence, and that's part of the difficulty with this. Okay, I hope that helps. Well, just to say that um, some... Sorry, Chair. Sorry, right, sir. <laughs> yeah, just, just to say that some residents I speak to are very fearful of the people yes. causing antisocial behaviour yes. and don't want to be seen or even... There's mm. a whisper that 
they might have said. Yes. Well, maybe... And so you let the staff know so that we don't. Yeah. 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 Definitely, I come across that. If you don't mind, I'll just come in at the end there a little bit. So, I mean, in terms of people being fearful, we do get that quite a bit. We will treat it all as confidential. Um, but there is always the risk. People, when, especially with this ASB and noise, they're always going to assume it's their immediate neighbours. And most often it is their immediate neighbours who have reported. Um, that is unavoidable, unfortunately. We, we, we can't do much to, to control that risk. Um, in terms of, of, no, of noise nuisance, it's also a little bit about managing expectations and helping our residents understand it because statutory noise nuisance is a high threshold. It really is the worst type of noise. It's a criminal act, so, so we're looking for really substantial noise nuisance. Um, and the world we live in with development all around us and, and people living far closer together. We far a lot of voices, don't we? Yeah. And, and we far, don't, don't deal with voices. Absolutely. <laughs> far more densely packed housing as well. Yeah. People living in flats or yeah. converted houses that were never really designed to have multiple flats mm. in them. Um, noise has become far more intrusive. Um, people working from home, just the whole change in the working environment. People at home a lot more. Um, they're noticing things that they never noticed before because they were out till five, six o'clock in the evening. So it's challenging. It's about a bit of education and a bit of managing expectations as well. Thank you very much. And I must say about, um, you must always report it. I'm always saying, you know, if you don't report it, you can't do anything about it. And you have to build a case up. So, yeah. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I think that's the end of the meeting now, isn't it? Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. It's quick.